As some of you may know, I spent most of September in the United Kingdom. And while there, I heard some wonderfully interesting stories about the history, culture, and most importantly, the hauntings. In this episode, we're going to continue our UK theme, diving into some of the most prominent and spooky stories from Edinburgh. Hello? Welcome. This is the two cities. Edinburgh is the capital of Scotland, a place with cobbled streets winding through rows of beautiful buildings, with the stunning green hills of Arthur's Seat and a looming castle watching over the going-ons. Truly, of all the places I've visited, Edinburgh has been one of the most memorable. Walking up the steps from Waverley Station, looking up to Edinburgh Castle and the stunning architecture of the city incited a curiosity that I've never before experienced. The city is bursting with interesting history, curious tales, and spooky stories of murder and ruthless monsters. Though my adventure began with a more heartwarming tale. Many of our listeners know that Ellie and I love dogs. It's not exactly a secret. It's logical. They're loving and loyal, and if I'm honest, we don't deserve them. So, of course, I was enamored with the tale of Greyfriars Bobby, a pup who refused to let the death of his master end his loyalty. In 1858, John Gray, an Edinburgh police night watchman, died. His Sky Terrier, Bobby, was beside himself. Gray was buried in the Greyfriar Kirkyard, the cemetery surrounding the Greyfriars Kirk in Old Town, Edinburgh. Bobby spent the following 14 years sitting on his master's grave. He became well known in Edinburgh, and when he passed in 1872, he was buried just inside the gate of the Greyfriars Kirkyard, not far from where his beloved master was laid to rest. I had heard the story prior to visiting Edinburgh, and it's what drew me to Greyfriars. But, little did I know, there were other, more frightening stories lurking in the cemetery. One that quite literally made me jump out of my skin. Very frightening. Very frightening in there. I wouldn't go in there on my own. There was something not right. Something in that churchyard. I would not go in there at night on my own. Not that chance. Um, the whole thing kind of freaks me out. Greyfriars Kirk is a church of the Church of Scotland. The church itself stands on the site of a pre-Reformation establishment of the Franciscan order, the Greyfriars. Greyfriars is one of the oldest buildings still standing in Old Town, Edinburgh. Its construction began in 1602 and was completed in 1620. For a time, the kirk was divided, with the old Greyfriars built in 1614 and the new Greyfriars, which was built in 1718. Upon entering the cemetery, you pass an old, heavy gate. The church stands just before you, and Bobby's grave is right there. Though, turning your gaze in any direction, you see dark walls, ornate headstones, and dark mausoleums. Scotland's religious turmoil has left scars here. The Covenanters were a Scottish Presbyterian movement that rose to assure that the Roman Catholic faith would not regain a hold upon Scotland. There's a horrid history here, as in 1679, 1,200 Scottish Covenanters were imprisoned in the Kirkyard pending trial, based on the Scots Confession of Faith signed by King James VI in 1560, Scotland and the Church of Scotland had denounced the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. Though, in 1637, King Charles I and William Laud, the Archbishop of Canterbury, attempted to impose a new liturgy on Scots. A riot was organized at St. Giles Cathedral by Jenny Geeds. With a fear of further action by the King, Archibald Johnson worked to revive the negative confession of 1581, and work with Alexander Henderson to finalize the National Covenant, as it was called, in 1638. On February 28, 1638, an elaborate oath to maintain their Reformed religion was signed at Greyfriars Kirk. 
those who signed the oath promise to maintain the religion as it was in 1580 and reject all innovations introduced since that time. In 1640, the covenant was adopted by Scottish Parliament and its subscription a requirement of all Scots. The Covenanters raised an army to resist Charles I's religious reforms. This crisis helped bring about the War of Three Kingdoms, which included the English Civil War, the Scottish Civil War, and the Irish Confederate Wars. For ten years post-British Civil War, the Covenanters were the de facto government in Scotland. Scottish support of the English Parliament over the King sparked the outbreak of the Civil War in Scotland in 1644, which lasted until 1647. By 1649, the plague had made its way to Scotland, only problematizing the already tense times. And 1650 to 1652, under the English Parliament led by Oliver Cromwell, lowland Scotland was occupied by the new model army. Cromwell's imposed Commonwealth left Scotland to live in temporary union with England, removing all civil power of the Covenanters. The restoration of Charles II brought his denunciation of all covenants in 1662. With the restoration of the Episcopacy, rebel ministers began to preach at open-air meetings, and a period of sustained persecution began. Covenanters led armed rebellions, and were accused of committing many horrible crimes. The Covenanters were defeated at the Battle of Bothwell Brig, and 1,200 rebels were captured and taken to Edinburgh. 400 were imprisoned at Greyfriars throughout the harsh winter months. Soon, the government, in an attempt to end the rebellion of religious ideology, authorized field executions without trial. This became known as the Killing Time. In 1687, James's indulgence allowed for all to, quote, serve God after their own way and manner, which promoted a degree of Presbyterian tolerance. The killing times are not forgotten. Memories are kept alive with monuments and tombstones across the south of Scotland, including in Greyfriars Kirkyard. In 1707, the monument was erected in the open space known as the Covenanters' Prison where 1,200 Covenanters were held. The monument claims that 18,000 were killed between 1661 and 1680. The area of the cemetery that held these people is now gated off, and there's a small plaque to memorialize those lost and the contentious times in Scottish history. But the inability to walk in that space felt strange. The area was laid out for burials in 1705, So there are now graves where the Covenanters were held. Some even died here. They had no shelter and were given only four ounces of bread a day. The sense that this place was a prison is reinforced by the large black gate. Moving just to the northeast corner of the Kirkyard, you'll find another connection to this dark tale, a black mausoleum with a horrifying story. The Black Mausoleum is the final resting place of King-appointed Lord Advocate Sir George Mackenzie, who led the bloody resistance against the Covenanters. He persecuted those who resisted the state-appointed religion and refused loyalty to the king. As I mentioned, when Charles II ascended the throne and revoked the Covenanters' right to practice their religion, a rebellion ensued. The Battle of Bothwell Brig brought blood and a brutal win for the king. As the Covenanters were rounded up and taken to Greyfriars Kirk, they would experience torture, deportation, starvation, and beheadings at the hands of Mackenzie, known as Bloody Mackenzie by his victims. He is said to have decorated the spiked gate of the prison with the heads of the men that he killed. Mackenzie, from the outside, seemed like a loving husband and father. He was a scholar, an author, and a man of society. His dark secret was his sadistic and cruel side. He was relentless in his vicious pursuit of a single unified religion during the killing time. It is said that Mackenzie was responsible for 18,000 deaths. Only death stopped his reign of terror. In 1691, when he died, he was ironically 
buried just a few hundred feet from the Covenanter's prison in Greyfriars Kirkyard. His casket was housed in a large black mausoleum, and the building itself is haunting. When I walked through the graveyard myself, it was as if it were looming over my shoulder. The tall, dark structure stands out, a large chain and lock on the doors, as if telling people something was being held inside, a prison for Mackenzie in his death, much like the prison he managed in his life. For 300 years, both Mackenzie's victims and the brutal Mackenzie rested just feet from one another, until 1998 when a homeless man, looking for shelter from rain, broke into the mausoleum. The tomb itself was fortified, but the man ransacked the tomb. He smashed caskets on every level until he found the one which held Mackenzie. As he tried to pry open the casket, a large hole opened in the floor of the mausoleum. He fell into the chamber below. The pit had been filled with the bodies of plague victims. During the plague, the sick died quickly, and their bodies were often unceremoniously thrown into pits and covered quickly to dispose of the ill and prevent further spread of the disease. The man was surrounded by putrefied bodies and the smell of rotting flesh. He ran screaming from the mausoleum into the darkness of night. The next day, another looked into the iron gates guarding the tomb and was, in her words, quote, blasted back off its steps by a cold force. Later, another woman was found unconscious at the foot of the mausoleum, her neck covered in bruises. Soon, Edinburgh was abuzz with the news. People began talking about the possibility of this man awakening a dark spirit. Since 1998, when the casket was defiled, over 500 ghostly attacks have been reported, many of which have been supported by photos of the injuries from the visit to the Kirkyard. Injuries vary from burns, gouges, unexplained bruises, broken bones, and the feeling of one's hair being pulled. Some claim to have been punched or kicked by an invisible force while near the tomb, though others feel nauseous or numb. People smell something foul or hear something strange, like floor knocks. They say these experiences travel back to their hotel with them. When I walk toward the mausoleum, I will admit I was scared. I had heard stories of the Kirkyard being haunted, though I was drawn here, like I said, because of Bobby, the cute little pupper who was eternally loyal to his master. I wandered with curiosity that was light despite the amount of skulls and other signals of death on the walls and headstones. The bodies below the surface seemed less frightening in comparison to this corner of the cemetery. When we turned the corner toward the mausoleum, I felt something heavy. I walked toward the building, but as my partner moved toward the barred windows, chained close, I shrieked not to look in. I couldn't bring myself to get closer. He, of course, wasn't worried and told me that it was just dark and that he couldn't see anything. But even then, I couldn't take a step closer. Like I said, I didn't know what this place was, but I knew that I didn't want to be near it anymore. We left, and that night, I decided to look into the history of the Kirkyard. I mean, I have a podcast on the peculiar. It would be unprofessional of me not to look into it. And when I discovered that the place I had stood was called the Black Mausoleum, housing the horrid, bloody Mackenzie, I had to return. I read that night that this is the most well-documented location of poltergeist activity in the world. So much happens here that in 2000, Colin Grant, an exorcist and minister of the Spiritualist Church, came to perform an exorcism on the graveyard. During the ceremony, he was overcome with the feeling of being surrounded by hundreds of tormented souls and spirits, trying to break into the mortal realm. He was so frightened that he left quickly. He later confessed that the evil was too powerful to overcome. He was found dead a few weeks later. He died of a sudden heart attack. More recently, in 2004, the tomb was broken into again. Two teenage boys removed a number of unidentified remains. 
the perverse boys beheaded a corpse that they used as a hand puppet, and they were found playing soccer with a skull. They were tried and found guilty under a centuries-old grave-robbing law. So, the next day, we came back. This time, I was armed with more knowledge of the place and tried to face my fears. We walked up to the Black Mausoleum, and for you, loyal listeners, I looked inside. I took my phone's flashlight and stuck it in between the heavy metal bars of the doors, and I illuminated the dark-walled interior. There it was, just like the story, a hole in the corner of the floor, the place where the homeless man must have fallen through, where the teenage boys robbed body parts. I looked only briefly before walking far from the mausoleum. I had to take a deep breath and move quickly down the path. There's something visually menacing about the Mackenzie plot. The dark mausoleum is a constant presence in the kirkyard. I found solace in walking past Bobby's grave again, and before heading back to our room that night, I made sure to rub the nose of the statue just outside the graveyard. The weathered statue's nose is shiny bronze because of how many pets it gets. I kept telling myself that the little dog was a means of protection for the people there. While I was scared, I never really felt any harm. And people walk through smiling and talking. Tourists are drawn there for a story about the true love between a person and their best friend, the most loyal and true animal. So while the history of Greyfriars Kirkyard may be dark, soaked in the blood of those persecuted for their religion, barred by the power of a monarchy, beheaded by a cold-blooded, heartless man, there will always be a little doggo waiting to steal the show, tell a happier tale, and remain the most well-known part of the area. People may feel cold and nauseous near the Black Mausoleum, but there's always a line of people waiting to boot Bobby Schnoop and take a picture with the immortalized pup. But perhaps that's the charm. A little dog that will stand beside you, loyally, while you face the darkness that can only be understood as evil. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our recent international episodes. If you haven't yet, head to the listening platform of your choice and catch up on our most recent episode featuring Ellie's dad's story of a haunted walking cane. It's actually really cool. And while you're there, rate, review, and subscribe. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Plus, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or email us at tales of the number two cities podcast at gmail.com. Don't forget, we have merch and are currently collecting entries for our contest. Winners will be featured in our merch shop and receive a free merch item. Email entries to tales of two cities podcast at gmail.com before midnight on December 15th. The winner will be announced in the new year. We have more episodes coming your way, but if you just can't wait, head to our Patreon and pledge what you can for bonus content and mini episodes. And a super special thanks to my friend Ricardo for recording the rad music in our episode. Thanks again for listening. We appreciate each of you. Until next time.